Last week we began the message on the Christian soldier's secret weapon. And Paul, after listing all of the armor of God in chapter 6, verse, verses 14 through 17, he adds one last vital component to the armor of God in verse 18, and that is prayer. Prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, Paul says. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. This is part of what we need to do in this spiritual war we're in. You see, Paul knew that no amount of armor or weapons alone could produce a valiant warrior. In order for the Christian soldier to stand against our scheming enemy, we've talked about that. We must pray. Why? Our battle is not with flesh and blood. If, it, if, if, if that would be the case, it would be easier. But it's not. It wouldn't be easy, but it'd be easier. We would have some kind of chance then, but we have no chance because our battle is against principalities and powers and against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Listen, folks, we need the strength and the wisdom that comes from above. We need heaven's wisdom. We need heaven's strength to make it in this battle. Therefore, prayer must be a continual, integral part of the Christian's life. And I mean, can I just say that again? Prayer, not just should be, but must be, that is, if we're going to overcome, must be a continual and integral part of the Christian's life. And I just need to start this message by asking you, is that a part, an integral, continual part of your Christian life? It's a question you need to ask yourself and answer today. If it's not, it can change. If it is, thank God for it. Prayer is the spiritual air the soldier must breathe. With it, we overcome. Without it, we do not have the strength or the wisdom required against a supernatural foe. So now let's just delve uh, further into verse 18 and, and this, this thing called prayer and, and find out what kind of praying is, what is Paul exactly, what is he talking about? He says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Paul says that we should be praying always on every occasion, in every situation, in the Spirit. Every situation should be a matter of prayer. You recall last week how we talked about in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel had experienced this great victory at Jericho, and then they thought, well, that was a big thing. We needed God for that. But now we've got this uh, little small place called Ai, and uh, they became overconfident. They didn't seek the Lord. They didn't pray. And what happened? They were soundly defeated. You see, no matter how great the situation may be or how small it may be, we need to be in constant communication with our heavenly headquarters. Can you say amen? amen. amen. The Greek word for prayer is really important here. Now, I, I want us to learn about prayer today. I, I, I want us to see that prayer is more than just give me, give me, give me, okay? Let's look at this and let's, let's, let's understand what it takes to be victorious in spiritual warfare, the Greek word for prayer here is the universal word for a reverent address to God and includes this. It includes adoration, devotion, and worship. So prayer is not just asking God for things. Certainly that's included. And we'll talk about that momentarily. But the word for prayer here is an act of devotion. An act of devotion. In fact, the context of the usage of the word for prayer in that early Greek culture, uh, the way they would come and pray to their, even to their Greek gods of that time, is they would, uh, they would come uh, and bring an offering with them. And, and, and they thought in their mind that if we, brought it, we bring an offering, well, then that means that it, our prayers would be accepted. And, and you probably say, well, uh, we don't do that. We don't need to bring an offering. But I would differ with you. We do need to bring an offering. 
And you say, well, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, we need to bring ourselves in an act of devotion and worship. In fact, Paul said it's our reasonable service to, to, be, uh, to present ourselves as a living sacrifice unto God. So that's what true prayer is. Oh, it's, in, it, it, it's asking. Don't get me wrong, but it's more than just asking. That's why, you know, most of you, you have your big list there and you ask. You say, man, I don't know, it took me five minutes or some of you might have took a half hour. But whatever the case, you know, I can't pray. But see, prayer is more than just bringing your wish list to God. When we pray, the kind of prayer necessary to stand against our scheming enemy must be more than just petition. In fact, Jesus taught us when he taught us how to pray. The, we call it the Lord's Prayer. It's really the disciples' prayer. He, he says we should pray our Father which art in heaven. Uh, hallowed be thy name. And he, and he talks about his kingdom coming and his will be done and all that. He, before we ever get to the part that says give us our daily bread, before we ask for ourselves it is an act of adoration, of worship. We don't just come to God's presence and just have our wish list. We are, prayer is more than that. Can you say amen? Now, certainly we need to ask. I, I, that's part of prayer too. Well, the Bible says we have not because we ask not. Now, some of you don't even bring your list. Amen? You don't bother to ask God for anything. So, so asking is absolutely necessary. We, we see that in our text when Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication. The word supplication means petition. It means to ask. It refers to making known one's specific needs and even conveying a sense of uh, urgency that the request be met. I've prayed those kind of prayers many times. So Paul is saying that in this spiritual warfare, on every occasion, in every situation, we should be praying and petitioning God. That is, we ought to be coming to God in devotion and worship and asking him with an urgency to move in our situations the battles that we're facing. Do you all get that? Say amen. amen. But there is more, more to this. There is something very important here that uh, you may be reading it and not paying attention to. And that would be a mistake because there's something that is very important here regarding prayer. Uh, the kind of prayer that is needed to be able to stand in the evil day. How many of you know what kind of prayer uh, that, that you need to have that kind of praying? I, I want to have, uh, though, I want to be able to pray that I can stand in the evil day. I want to know how to pray that way. Well, listen what it says here in verse 18. It says, praying always with all prayer and supplication. And then it says this, in the spirit. Can you say that with me? In the spirit. In the spirit. Paul says prayer should be in the spirit or in the realm of the spirit. We, we could say it like this, in the atmosphere of the Spirit. That is to say, prayer should be directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. To pray in the Spirit is to pray in concert with the Spirit. And if we're going to be effective in spiritual warfare, let me tell you folks, uh, we, we must not pray formal Prayers recited by rote or perfunctory, passionless prayers. What good is that against the powers of darkness we face? We need to pray prayers that have been empowered and influenced and led by the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? If our prayers are led by the Spirit, we will know that our prayers are consistent with the will and the mind of God. That's the kind of praying we need to pray. Now, this is why we need to be seeking the Lord for the fullness of the Spirit, for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We believe being filled with the Spirit is not just for a few select believers. No, sir. We believe that it is for all and indeed necessary for all in order to be overcomers. In fact, in the previous chapter here, uh, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, he says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Now, just so you know, that word excess means riotous living. 
It means debauchery. And guess what? When we get drunk with wine, what does it produce? It produces riotous living debauchery. And you are being controlled by that substance. It doesn't mean, as some say, well, it's okay to drink, but just don't do it in excess. No, that's not what this means. Hello? Hmm. Maybe I'll just stay there for a while, you think. But no, don't be drunk with wine where, where it's going to produce debauchery, riotous living. But contrary to that, be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit means to be influenced by the Spirit, carried along by the Spirit, controlled by the Holy Spirit. Listen, Paul is saying we are not to be influenced by alcohol controlled by alcohol, or anything else for that matter. But we are to be, as Christians, filled, controlled by, influenced by the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives if we're going to pray effectively and overcome in this spiritual war. Do you believe that? Listen to what Paul says, in case you don't believe that. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. This is very powerful. He says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Uh, who is it that helps us? The Spirit. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit make, itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered or, we could say, articulated. He, and he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Listen, he says, we don't, we don't know what to pray for as we ought. That's something you need to learn. You don't know how to pray as you ought to pray. Well, I do, Pat. No, you don't. Not without the help of the Holy Spirit. That's what the scripture tells us here. You say, well, why? Well, let me just say it again. We're fighting against the crafty foe who is working in that spiritual realm. But the Spirit of God knows exactly what he's up to and knows how to lead us and empower us as we pray. That's number one. But number two, something really important here. We don't know what God's up to. <laughs> Not only do we not know in our flesh the schemes and the plans of the enemy, but we don't know what God is orchestrating. Oh, we know he loves us and he wants what is best for us, but we have no way of knowing all the particulars about the matter. This is why we need to pray in the Spirit. Without the help of the Spirit, we pray in light of what we think is best for us or what we think is best for those we are praying for. Oh, come on now. The problem with that is we only see through a glass darkly. We don't know the beginning from the end. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what's best. We don't know it. We don't know. We don't see what the Spirit of God sees and what He knows. Therefore, we must pray in the Spirit and depend upon Him to help us. Proverbs chapter 3 gives us some insight here. It says in verse 5 and 6, one of my favorite scriptures says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. The word understanding here is in the Hebrew is a, is a military term. And it means basically intelligence. Soldiers in that day would climb to the top of a mountain to get a view of the enemy in order that they would come up with the right strategy. And so what they were doing when they went up on that mountain is they were gathering intelligence. We don't do it that way today, but that's how they did it in those days. And God says, don't lean on your own ability to climb up high and see things from every human perspective. Don't do that. And perhaps, perhaps you've done so and you think that you've got it all figured out. Let me tell you, that's a huge mistake. 
That's a big time mistake. You don't have it figured out. You don't know what God knows. You don't know what the Holy Spirit knows. But on the other hand, perhaps you have done, you've went up on that mountain and you've looked and you've surveyed it and you've looked at every angle and you say, I don't even see any way out of this mess that I'm in. I, I'm in such a mess. There's no way out. Oh, God's got another option, folks. Oh, God's got another option. Listen, this is why we need to pray in the Spirit. We need to pray with the help of the Holy Spirit because we simply do not have the ability to gather the intelligence or have the wisdom or the strength to know what to do in the spiritual battle we're in. We can't know. We can't see what the Spirit of God knows and sees. He is all-knowing, and we're not. Therefore, the scripture here tells us not to lean to our own understanding, but trust in the Lord, trust in him. And then it says in verse six, it says, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. In all thy ways means in every, every road or the course of life. Acknowledge him in everything we do. Acknowledge means to be aware of, be focused upon and dependent upon God. That's what prayer does. It speaks of fellowship and intimacy with God not just to tip one's hat at him. We must pray in the Spirit, with the help of the Spirit, in the realm of the Spirit, influenced by the Spirit. Are you with me? Now let's look at this, let's look at this word helpeth in, in verse, verse 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. It's an interesting word, and I don't, I, I, I always want to be careful. I don't talk about Greek words too much. Get you all, you, sometimes you shut it off, and I don't want you to shut it off. I want you to listen to this, because this is really very powerful. It's, a, it's an interesting word, the word for helpeth. It's a combination of three words in the, in the Greek, and if we could put it up there, I will not try to say it. Can we put that up there? There we go. You can try to say it if you want to. I'm not going to try to say that word. The root word is lambano. It means simply to take or to hold. But, but the, the first two words here are, are Greek prefixes, soon and anti. And they give a lot of insight into this word. So stay with me here. Soon means together with. Together with. So together with us, he the Holy Spirit takes hold of our burden in order to help. We have our part. He has his. So if we want his help, we have to cooperate with him. Can you say amen? Okay. Now, the second prefix is anti. It means opposite to or before. And a great, great way to illustrate this is to picture this is imagine a man struggling to move a heavy log. And along comes another man who picks up the other end to help. One is on each end of the log and they face each other as they work together to move the log. It is in this same way the Holy Spirit comes alongside us to help us in our weakness. This word was, it was used where Martha says to the Lord, you recall Martha this, getting upset because Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 40, here's what she said. She said, bid her, therefore, that she help me. There's that big word again. Help me. One could translate it like this. Bid her lend me a helping hand. The idea being that Martha would continue preparing the meal, but needed Mary to help her. And just so, the Holy Spirit indwelling the Christian soldier comes to the aid of that soldier in his spiritual problems and difficulties, not by taking over the responsibility for them and giving the saint or the soldier an automatic deliverance without any effort on his part. He still must pray. We must pray. But the Holy Spirit helps us, strengthens us, gives us wisdom, and leads us into the will of God. Wow. This is just a big wow for me. We have not been left helpless. In fact, Jesus said, I'll send another 
comforter, that he may abide with you forever. That's the, it's the Greek word parakletos. It means one called alongside to help. Oh, glory to God. So when you're praying in the Spirit who is praying, you are the Holy Spirit. Well, the answer is both. The Holy Spirit's praying with you. You cannot do it without him. He won't do it without you. It's just a privilege, folks. It's an absolute privilege to partner with the Holy Spirit as we pray. He wants to think through our minds. He wants to pray through our lips. He wants to weep through our eyes. He wants to groan through our spirit. It is an absolute blessedness to have the parakletos, the one called alongside to help us in our life. What a blessedness it is to have the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me show you something here that I think will encourage you as a Christian soldier as you battle through your trials. Now, this is just, this makes me just really excited. I, I don't know if I can contain it when I start thinking about it because just get all, I mean, inside of me, I could explode, it feels like. It's powerful. Now, you may not think so, but if you know the word, it's, this is powerful. The entire context of this passage in Romans 8 has to do with groaning and suffering. You can read it for yourself. The Bible it even says even creation is groaning. They're awaiting redemption, the deliverance. And it talks about how we groan in prayer, according to verse 26, which we just read. But, but we, we, read, we read verse 26, and we were read verse 27, but then verse 28. I love this. It says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now notice this. Notice how this begins with a conjunct conjunction, and it says, And we know. Connecting it to the previous thing that has been said. And we know. Well, what do we know? Well, we know this, that when we pray in the Spirit, we will be praying the will of God. And as a result, listen to this, all things work together for our good, for our eternal good. What a promise this is. All things work together for good. Ah, when we pray them through in the Spirit. Hear me now, folks. You can take that which you face to God, and he will ultimately bring good out of it, no matter what it is that you're praying, if you pray it through in the Spirit. If you allow the Spirit to pray with you, through you, lead you, and guide you, and influence you, if you'll pray that way, you'll pray the will of God. And I want to tell you, folks, it'll turn out for your eternal good. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful for that. Thank God, no matter what I'm going through, I have this promise if I'll pray it through in the Spirit, God will bring good in the end. Oh, you're not getting it. Let me continue. Here's another great result of praying in the Spirit. In verse 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Listen, God's ultimate purpose for our lives, in case you don't know it, I'm going to tell you right now, his ultimate purpose is to not make everything all comfortable and all ro a bed of roses for you. It's to make us like his Son, Jesus. Guess what the result of those battles we go through, those groanings, those things where we need the Spirit's help and we ask Him to help us and we pray and we pray it through in the Spirit. You know what the result is? God will make you like Jesus. <laughs> well, glory. I said God will make you like Jesus when you pray in the Spirit with the Spirit's help. Wow. It's marvelous. It's wonderful. Listen, folks. You ever been in a battle? You been in a war? Do you know what you're going through? All that suffering is not in vain. But if you'll pray in the Spirit, God will bring God and He'll make you like His Son. Oh, how marvelous is that? How wonderful is that? <laughs> Onward, Christian soldiers. Praise God. 
all those hurtful, heartbreaking battles, God's working them out for your eternal good. And in the process, he's making you like Jesus. That's his purpose. That's what he wants to do. Well, then Paul says in verse 18, the latter part, he says, And watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Listen, in spiritual warfare, we must always be on the alert, always on the lookout. And this is, this is the Greek present tense, which speaks of habitual action. Listen, folks, this means we are to stick to praying and never quit praying not for ourselves, but for all saints. Remember again the Lord's Prayer. And think of this. He, does, he doesn't say, give me this day my daily bread. He said, give us this day our daily bread. He doesn't say, lead me. He said, lead us. He doesn't say, deliver me. Deliver us. And we're to pray for everybody. Listen, we're not alone in this battle. We're all soldiers in God's army. This conflict with doubt and dismay and fear and confusion and uncertainty. We have fellow soldiers that are going through those things. Sometimes you may feel like you're on top of it. Somebody else isn't. Sometimes you're not on top of it and they are. But we need each other. We can't just every man for himself. That's not the way of God there are other people around you who are weaker and younger in Christ than you are. And on the other hand, you may be the strongest of believers and, and still be going through unimaginable difficulty. And we are all in this thing together. We cannot put the armor of God on for that other person, but we can pray for that other person. We, we, can, we can call in reinforcements. We can... We can when we find that they're in a struggle that is greater than they can handle, we can pray for them. We can be aware that there are other people in this war that need help. And we are, have the responsibility to pray for one another. Paul would even ask for prayer himself. Verse 19, which proves how desperately we all need prayer. I mean, the great apostle says, pray for me. He says, and for me, this, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He, he said, I need prayer. But, but notice that when Paul is asking for prayer, he's not asking to be set free from his imprisonment. He's in prison, you know. But he's, he's, he's saying that he wants his tongue to be set free, that he, he wants to be enabled by the Spirit to speak freely of the gospel, the good news. And I'll tell you, folks, this is the mindset of a man fully armed in spiritual warfare and controlled and influenced by the Spirit. He knew. He knew that God had him where he was at in that prison for the furtherance of the gospel. He understood that God was in control, and if God wanted to, he could bring him out in a moment's time. He understood that, and thus his prayer was not for comfort, but for the mission and let me tell you, folks, you can't pray like that unless you're filled with the Spirit. And the Spirit is leading you in your praying. You can never pray that way without the Spirit. John Piper writes something that is so good concerning this. He says, prayer is for mission. It is mainly for those on the front lines of the war effort to call into headquarters to send help. And one of the reasons for our prayer malfunction is that we try to treat it like a domestic intercom for calling the butler for another pillow in the den rather than treat it like a wartime walkie-talkie for calling down the power of the Holy Spirit in the battle for souls and how true that is. How true that is. Much of our praying is for ourselves. And I talk about that as we close here just for a minute. Much of our praying is for ourselves. It's bless me and mine, us for no more. Prayers, that's how we pray. But when you pray in the Spirit, you will pray for others. You will pray for the mission. You will pray for souls. When we pray mission prayers, that's evidence that you're praying in the Spirit. Hmm. What would happen? What would happen if we all began to pray in the Spirit? I prayed for you, you prayed for me, and we all pray for each other. 
What would happen if we prayed mission prayers instead of comfort prayers? Hmm. I can tell you, God would begin to move in our families, in our children, in our church. Souls would be saved. Broken homes would be put back together. Drug addicts set free. Sick bodies healed. This is why I still believe in the old-fashioned time of prayer around the altar. That's why I still believe in that. Because praying for one another is important. You see, we get so self-centered, I don't need to pray, but we need to pray for one another. There's something very powerful about that. You can do a study of history yourself, and you'll find, when you study the history of the church, that every awakening came when the people of God prayed, not only for themselves, but for others. And folks, not only does God move when we pray for others on their behalf, but He moves as well on our behalf. In fact, think of this. Our prayer sets in motion the biblical principle of given. It shall be given. And we want to use that just for money. But given, it shall be given. When you give in prayer, God's going to bring it back. Press down, shaking together and running over. When Job, who was full of sores and had lost his family, everything, his possessions, his money, and he needed prayer himself. The Bible says he prayed for his so-called friends. And God turns the situation around. There's something very powerful that happens when we quit being so me-oriented and we begin to pray for others. God begins to move in your behalf. You see, if we would pray mission prayers instead of comfort prayers, we'd see a lot of things happen in our own lives as well as the lives of others. Samuel Chadwick I think he sums up the power of prayer best. He says, there is no power like that of prevailing prayer. It turns ordinary mortals into men of power. It brings power. It brings fire. It brings rain. It brings life. It brings God. So I wonder, why don't we pray? Why don't we pray? Why do we pray when we do pray? Only for ourselves.